water uh, is one that we hear fairly frequently in the transportation and planning profession, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, the capacity of a transportation system, that, that traffic will follow the path of least resistance. However, that's generally where the comparison stops, and rarely do we delve deeper into that, uh, that analogy. It's only when we view streets and their surrounding neighborhoods as an e from an ecological perspective that we start to understand how much waterways and roadways have in common. So we'll start very general. Um, both are corridors that support life. Uh, they allow us to move around and access the resources and the environment in which we live. Uh, get to our homes, get to food, get to jobs. Um, they're also critical to the economic health of our communities and our country as a whole. On the case of the second set of pictures on the bottom there, uh, uh, they are serving as corridors to move freight um, you know, to major destinations. Uh, in our smaller cities on smaller scales, uh, as in the, the last set of pictures that popped up, they're places where we recreate, where we have the interactions with one another that really form a community. However, both also harness a great deal of power, which can turn destructive, uh, both for individuals who utilize the corridor as well as for the larger environment surrounding it. We'll come back to this a little bit later and discuss the second scenario in a little bit more detail. So next I want to talk a little bit about uh, different types of facilities and their different functions. Uh, the first one that we're looking at is a channelized river that's fairly high volume, high speed, and an interstate highway. Those are one end of the spectrum. Um, both are very successful at moving large volumes from one place to another. However, they're not good at supporting a surrounding ecosystem. In fact, they can be quite detrimental to its health. Uh, the next one in the middle, we have uh, major rivers, for example, the Mississippi, the Ohio River, the Delaware, and urban arterial streets. Here in Columbus, uh, this is a picture of High Street. Um, if you're in Chicago, Clark Street, Ogden Avenue in San Francisco, that might be Market Street. Uh, both are still, really, still fairly high volume roadways and they move a lot of traffic, but they do so at lower speeds. Uh, both are central to the corridors, or the central corridors running through and providing access to either the watershed or the city that they're in. And the last one we're going to look at is our smaller streams and our residential streets. They carry very low volumes and generally are at low speeds. They provide the greatest access uh, to those living in the, the ecosystem or the neighborhood around them. So they're the most accessible, the most uh, capable of supporting that surrounding ecosystem. What we're going to focus on are these middle ones. And the reason we're going to focus on the major rivers and arterial streets is because those are the ones that have the most demand on them from the greatest parts or the greatest uh, range of our society or the, the habitat that they're in. Um, they serve as in some ways to carry freight. Uh, they serve in some ways similar to uh, the interstate highways or a channelized river, but they also serve functions of smaller streams and residential streets. People live on these, people have their businesses on them, and people interact on these on a daily basis. So this is where we see the greatest cross-section of our communities come together. Uh, and generally these are the backbones uh, of our communities. And this is taking a big picture look. This is uh, <clears throat> looking at uh, the aerial of both an urban neighborhood with the street, the corridor running through the middle of it. And show, the left shows how the uh, stream running through the middle of a riparian corridor, and that stream supports the life that occurs within that corridor. When healthy, both are central to a surrounding ecosystem. <clears throat> You have diverse wildlife and diverse community. You have a variety of uh, food sources and a variety of activities going on. Both are uh, central to the food chain, or in the case of uh, local economic relationships. So looking at a little more detail, and this is one of the two graphs that we've included in the presentation. Um, the image on the left is called a hydrograph, and it illustrates the flow of a stream as a rain event occurs. So as the rain starts, the uh, solid line starts to climb. The flow in the stream goes from your normal daily uh, flow to a much higher amount than the, you head towards a 
peak flow. As the uh, rain event stops, then the uh, river levels or the stream levels start to return to normal. If you look at the image on the right, that can be analogous to our AM and PM rush hour. Uh, you have traffic flowing during the day or during the late evenings is relatively low and as uh, particularly afternoon rush hour is 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock start to uh, the traffic starts to grow similar to the graph on the left. Uh, looks like somebody was having a little fun with uh, Photoshop in the lower right. Uh, if you can't see that it's you'll never go, get to work on time. Ha ha. <clears throat> uh, we have a comparison between water velocity the high velocity of flow of water on the left makes it difficult for habitat to exist along that stream. Similarly, the high velocity along streets and, and uh, highways can make the area adjacent to them inhospitable based on noise, uh, air quality, or uh, just general safety of the neighboring residents. Now what we want to talk about is what happens when these corridors are not healthy. Um, what we want to focus on are, as we said earlier, our old, older urban neighborhoods that generally tend to be just outside of the central business district. They tend to have these arterial streets uh, that were originally the, the keyways into and out of the downtown areas. Uh, over, the, over the years, and as sprawl has affected most cities, what's happened is people live further and further out, and while highways are built uh, to get people out to the suburbs, a lot of times these urban streets that were the commercial corridor to the surrounding neighborhood as well as a way in and out of the city become secondary freeways or overflows for the interstate system. And we want to look at what happens when uh, that roadway is not operating the way it was originally intended and the way it originally developed. And the comparison is with a stream corridor that's not operating in a healthy manner. Uh, what happens is when we start to see too much volume or too high of speeds moving through the corridor, we start to see uh, bank erosion. Um, similarly, we start to see erosion of the nutrient-rich nutrient components of a community when traffic volumes and speeds are too high. What I mean by nutrient-rich components are the community members who would generally be out on the streets interacting with one another, supporting local businesses, uh, when we see high volumes of traffic and high speeds, it becomes a more dangerous place for the, the quote-unquote wildlife to be and to cross. And we see limited access, we see limited interactions, and we see limited e economic opportunity. Hey, Aaron, corridors. I'm, I'm going to pause you for just a second. For some reason, when we yep. came off the polls, a handful of people didn't get the slides back. So what I'm going to do is just change the presenter uh, back to me and then back to you, and hopefully that will fix the problem, OK? OK. Are we in? Are we all on the same slides now? We should have uh, a stream corridor and a house on the left-hand side, and should say loss of habitat at the bottom. OK, it looks like we're, we're back on track. Thanks so much for okay. uh, pausing for a second. Perfect. Well, as we were saying, uh, when we see high volumes of both water and traffic, um, it starts to erode away the soil or the nutrient-rich parts of the community or the, the ecosystem. What that leads to along a stream is as the bank erodes away, so too does the root system of the vegetation that comprises the riparian corridor. This eliminates the habitat for all the various critters and, and animals that live in and rely on that stream corridor and that really make up the food chain. Oh, I think we just got something... Uh, we have a little bit of a lag, maybe? I'm just slipping it back. A couple of people said they still lost it, so we're going to try that one more time. OK. okay. Thanks. OK. Yep. In a neighborhood, what we see is as people and local businesses begin to disappear from the neighborhood, the effect of community erosion is compounded. There become fewer and fewer people to watch over and care for the buildings and one another, and things start to fall into disrepair. In the uh, sociology field, we call this the broken window syndrome. Uh, and it really starts to 
symbolize to people from outside of the community that this is an unsafe area, a place that isn't cared for, a place that people don't care about. In the ecological world, uh, with loss of habitat comes a loss of balance and diversity. Uh, for all of us from the Midwest who have done any environmental planning, uh, the photo of the Indiana bat at the top might bring back some nightmares. Uh, they tend to be the scourge of any NEPA documents we try to create. Uh, yet this species is a prime example of how development and habitat loss can really start to decimate biological diversity. Um, as the corridor loses its native species, it presents the opportunities for invasive species to move in. Uh, as in many, or as many urban neighborhoods continue to struggle and decline, the streets become more vacant. We see the eyes on the street that uh, Jane Jacobs describes so well in her book uh, start to disappear and be replaced with things like red light cameras. That informal social network and social control it has to be replaced with formal regulatory controls uh, because the community doesn't have the, uh, the strength or the, the folks there to, to ensure those controls are kept in place. Uh, this actual and symbolic abandonment of the neighborhood provides an opening for criminal activity, uh, violence, gang activity, and we start to see things like this. Uh, this is a convenience store in a neighborhood on the north side of Columbus that actually has a memorial service for everyone who's been uh, killed in gang violence in that neighborhood during the year. It's definitely a Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can all hear you. It's a, uh, okay, great. It's a, a very, very obvious uh, symbol of the erosion that's happened in this community, um, due in large part to the arterial streets that basically serve as urban highways through it. So, the next question we'd ask is, how did we get here? And we're going to use an example from Minneapolis. Uh, this is no offense to Minneapolis. My parents actually live there, and uh, I love it. Um, so I'm going to, that's my disclaimer at the beginning. Um, this is Hennepin Avenue at 7th Avenue in downtown Minneapolis. And what we want to show here is in the 1920s, uh, if we look at the diversity of uses of this street, um, it's, it's a very public space. It's a space where people are going and interacting. On the bottom right, we see a little... Uh, stand of some kind, um, people just kind of milling about on the sidewalk, which is fairly common today too, but what you don't see today is people milling about, talking, and hanging out in the street. Um, there's no real strong line about where the people space is and where the car space is, and in the center you've got trolleys going up and down. There's actually street lights and street signs in the middle of the street. Um, it's, it's basically a public shared space. We're going to jump to that same intersection in 1951 we start to see is a little bit more definition of whose space is whose. You've got people crossing in the prior picture, which we're going to go back to real quickly. People are just kind of crossing the street wherever they feel like, you know, wherever there's a break, wherever it's convenient. You need to go to the store or you want to go get lunch at the, uh, the restaurant. You basically cross the street wherever you need to. In this picture in 1951, what's happening is we're getting more defined space. Uh, the buses, the park, cars on the sides, um, are all defining the space more where people belong, where vehicles belong. Um, and we really don't see any more bicycles as we saw in the, uh, in the 1920 picture. The signs and the scale of buildings are getting larger because we're now at more of an automobile scale. And finally, we're going to jump to 2007. And what we see here is a very, very defined space about where cars belong and where people belong. Um, it's no coincidence that while there are wide sidewalks, in this area, and it's actually a very vibrant part of downtown. There's all kind of theaters and things. We don't see a lot of people out walking on the street. It's just not a pedestrian realm anymore. Um, there are bike lanes up the middle of Hennepin here, um, and it is a fairly uh, well-used corridor, but uh, more often than not, you're going to see this corridor dominated by cars and vehicles now rather than all different modes. So the way we got here was for decades, our approach to managing stormwater and traffic was very much the same. We wanted to move as much volume, either as efficiently as possible from one place to another. So we'd build one of these, or we'd build one of these, and these aren't any particular communities. We all have them. 
And then we channel water and traffic to and from the site by adding capacity to these or to our roadways like this. Uh, this is a, if anybody's seen uh, mobility presentations, this is a fairly common picture on the right. Um, everybody can try to pick out the pedestrian. Uh, he's hanging out at, in between the uh, travel lane and the left turn lane there waiting to get across. So in these situations, the emphasis is on moving traffic, whether it's water or vehicles. Uh, however, it also facilitates speeding because we've got wider facilities that are able to handle more. So when they aren't congested, it's more comfortable to move at higher speeds. It creates an unsafe environment really for everyone, um, including the, the motorist or in the case of uh, the waterway, really any animals or people trying to use it. And it reduces the, the comfort and the value of the surrounding area. Uh, property values in the case of the, uh, the roadway are down, go down because it's just not a, a place that people want to spend a lot of time. In the case of the uh, riparian corridor, the value of that corridor goes down. As we talked about, the biological diversity goes down, and it's less able to support life. Um, so we generally did this without much thought to the impact that it would have on the surrounding community or habitat. So this, this is a, a question for the pessimist or the optimist. Is the glass half full or the glass half empty? Well, to the engineer, it's neither. It's twice as big as it needs to be. The reason I uh, put this example in here is to give you some perspective on the way many roads are designed. I mentioned earlier the, uh, the graph illustrating the flow of traffic and how it peaks during the rush hour. Well, this is some actual uh, traffic numbers. The uh, line, the top edge of the green space at the top shows uh, 2,600. Those are the number of vehicles per hour that this roadway can carry. The lower line is the actual vehicles being carried by this roadway as the day goes on from uh, real counts. You can see this, this roadway happens to be one way towards downtown, so you see the spike in the morning rush hour just before 8 o'clock. The reason this visual is here though is to show you um, an example of the amount of surplus capacity that really goes into a roadway corridor. When policy dictates that the road is designed for a level of service C or B or higher, you have uh, percentages much less than 50 percent of the roadway being utilized even during the peak hour and less than that during the non-rush hour time frame. <clears throat> uh, some may be familiar with these next two slides from Don Appleyard's Livable Streets, but it illustrates the relationship or the inverse relationship between the flow of traffic. Uh, the first slide is light traffic at reasonable, reasonably low speeds, and the uh, spaghetti of lines crossing the street are all interactions between neighbors or people um, visiting friends or buying or selling. Uh, basically meeting on the street. This slide illustrates what happens when you introduce heavy traffic or uh, higher speeds and higher volumes. The likelihood of people crossing that street goes way down and people tend to get in their car to do those activities that we described on the last slide. But the, bad, the news isn't all bad. We've recognized the damage this causes. We figured out solutions that work. We develop expertise to repair the damage and establish laws and policies to, uh, of the government to require their implementation, at least for waterways. Over the last uh, 40 years or so, <clears throat> the uh, regulations have increased through the Clean Water Act and, and implementation has evolved from that um, move the water as quickly as possible to avoid standing water to today where water quality is an important uh, consideration in every, every project being designed. Um, we've uh, kind of developed a term you may have heard of natural stream design, which allows the stream to operate uh, to, in the balance with the uh, ecosystem. And the series of slides show a channelized stream and then the uh, stream at the bottom after restoration 
where uh, some of the sinuosity has been reintroduced and the uh, adjoining um, foliage has regrown. We uh, consider water quality. Uh, you may have heard the term BMPs or best management practices. And these are devices now required as part of design uh, for stormwater to uh, allow sediment and contaminants to be filtered out prior to them being deposited in uh, natural streams. We manage the volumes and velocities. Uh, the bullet point mentions on-site detention, retention, or infiltration. Uh, those are various techniques to basically hold the water uh, as long as you can to more uh, even out the flow of water in the natural stream so you don't get that high velocity uh, and then the resulting erosion. And then uh, the laws and policies that are in place, I mentioned the Water Clean Water Act, which is the second one listed, the National Environmental Protection Act. Um, <clears throat> all laws at various levels to make this a part of, a required part of the design process. What if we applied those same principles to our streets? I believe we have another poll that we'd like to ask at this time as to how many of the participants have design metrics for non-motorized travel. I mentioned the level of service. Uh, that, is a, that is one of the prime uh, measurements of vehicular flow of traffic. Um, at this point in time, the uh, evolution of measuring and quantifying how many pedestrians, cyclists, um, people using anything other than a, a standard car, uh, how many are using the facility and how many are desired to use the facility. So I think the poll is open now. And what I'm finding is that not many communities have any guidelines for their technical staff. Uh, keeping in mind that I'm speaking from the engineer's perspective, um, <clears throat> technical staff to set the measurable criteria. There are uh, numerous com communities that have a policy that says we will design our roads to level of service C or D, but not many communities, even with complete streets policies, have a numeric value to say we will have a bicycle mode shift of X percent. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and we'll be able to see the results. And okay. it looks like exactly what you said, Brian. So 63% said their organization does not have performance measures for non-vehicular modes, while 18% said yes and 19% said not sure. Okay. Uh, that's actually better than I was expecting. There's, uh, I'm not aware of any communities around central Ohio that currently have that uh, measurable um, uh, level. So if we applied these same principles to our streets and called it natural street design, restore the streets to natural functions as public spaces, prioritize people over vehicles, <clears throat> and create conditions where modes can travel and share the same space. And one of the reasons that um, Aaron and I got into this conversation or development of this as well is the fact that we do uh, kind of blend that engineering and planning perspective and recognize the uh, interaction between transportation and land use. <clears throat> you may wonder why we have the photos on the right, but um, notice the Sesame Street has the people all out on the street. and. Uh, it's Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, not Mr. Rogers' subdivision. So to further explore this concept of natural street design, I mentioned best management practices for water quality before. So you have rain gardens, uh, which encourage the water to infiltrate into the ground right on site. Detention or retention ponds, which have been used for a number of years now. Uh, similar purpose, they're basically holding water to um, release the water more slowly into the surrounding storm system or streams. They're, they're holding it in a large surface water. What if we applied travel demand management? By mixing land uses, uh, we would 
preclude some of those trips from ever occurring. Uh, so if we're trying to mitigate that peak hour, if we know that uh, the design of roadways is largely driven by the rush hour traffic, if we can mitigate that during the peak hour, then we can make our roads a smaller size and uh, help keep the uh, two sides of a street tied together a little bit better. By mixing land uses, people have a place to go, so they may be living above where they work and never make the trip, or they may have a destination after work, such as a club, to um, hang around a while in uh, the business area and leave at an off-peak hour. I mentioned living where you work and then also shifting the mode so that you're not part of that um, peak vehicular volume during the rush hour. Another options would be flow control. It's called a J-hook vein. Uh, basically these are uh, stone devices placed within a stream to help control speed. They also help to create different types of environments. Um, behind the J-hook vein, there's a uh, slower flow. The water has a chance to pool. Similarly, with pools and riffles, you have uh, slower flow in one area, and then you have the aeration that occurs as water flows over the rocks in a little bit greater velocity. Different types of uh, species um, prefer different types of environments. Uh, we may you make the analogy of traffic calming, slowing traffic down with um, on-street parking helps to create a buffer between the vehicle vehicles and make it more comfortable for the pedestrians. It also slows the vehicles, creating uh, medians, again, making the slower vehicles in a more walkable environment. And then intersection design, the illustration bottom is of a roundabout intersection. Obviously, somebody uh, real, had an eye for design, made a beautiful intersection there, but it also um, provides an area where the speeds of all the vehicles at that intersection and the noise levels, the uh, air quality is all improved by the intersection design. Access to habitat, giving people, the animals the ability to cross streams and access their food supply and places that they need to get to and ensuring people access the ability to cross the street frequently to get to make those connections that I showed in the earlier slide. The ability, if they do need to drive for part of their trip, the ability to um, park in a public parking lot as opposed to having a series of private parking lots that may be oversized and basically um, separating uses so that it's more difficult for people to walk from one to the other. And then the multimodal options, again, giving people who maybe don't want to drive or can't drive the option of traveling. Restoration of habitat. Uh, I showed the slide earlier that showed the, the stream going in three stages. This shows actual construction of the, uh, or reconstruction of a stream that has better balanced vegetation, has the different um, stream forms that benefit different species. And that can be made analogous to placemaking for people that have different types of activities that they like to participate in. Maybe some people would uh, stick to the quiet areas where they can uh, sit in a side street and have their coffee. Uh, other people maybe want to be in the plaza on the upper right that where they're in the middle of a crowd and that's the kind of place they like to go to. And this last uh, comparison is one of the most critical when we're talking about these older urban neighborhoods that have seen a lot of disinvestment and a lot of uh, flight out of the neighborhood uh, because we can fix the road all we want but unless we're encouraging redevelopment of the neighborhood and making it a place basically restoring the habitat of the community uh, us just fixing the roadway isn't going to bring back the community. So it's, it's incredibly important that we make these places that people want to live feel comfortable spending time in and want to open businesses in again. So we're going to ask the question again, whose safety and quality of life is more important, the frog or our children? Hopefully we've 
we're all in agreement that our children and communities are at least as important as the wildlife living along our waterways. But we really need to move beyond understanding the problem and discussing a, a theoretical concept such as natural street design. Uh, as useful as we've found it, um, without a path to implementation, we'll continue to look and talk about this problem for years to come. So now we're going to move a little bit from concept into implementation. And we've got a picture of the Lorax up here, because the Lorax was the champion of the environmental movement. Um, he was the one that speaks for the trees. And in building healthy, walkable communities, we also have champions. Uh, folks may recognize Dan Burden, who's been doing this for years, and Mark Fenton on the, um, in the left picture there. Both of them have been champions of creating walkable, active communities for years. My guess is there's something to do with great mustaches that makes you a champion of causes, because all three have them. Um, there must be something secret to that. The issue is these champions alone can't restore the success of our urban neighborhoods. It requires professionals, such as planners and engineers like ourselves, elected officials, and community members all buying in and working together to affect these significant changes that are needed. My favorite quote from the, the book, The Lorax, is, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, Nothing is going to get better. It's not. And that's really a call to action um, to move from this dialogue that we're having, these, these conceptual dialogues and identifying the problem, to actual implementation. So we're going to talk briefly about how this type of implementation might look and how it could take effect. Uh, like I said earlier, we're not going to unveil any brand new solutions. We don't have the magic bullet to uh, restore every struggling community in the country. But what we do have is, is an approach that's a little bit more collaborative and a little bit more comprehensive than we've perhaps taken in the past. And it's all following this concept of natural street design, returning the street which developed naturally on its own organically, just like our waterways do, or returning it to that natural function in the community. So it's going to require new collaborative efforts and relationships. We're starting to see this at the, at the federal level already. Um, we've got the partnership between uh, HUD, uh, the uh, DOT, and US EPA, um, which has been a great partnership, I think, now two years um, and running. What we need to do is move that into our states and into our local communities. Uh, we need to see more planning departments and engineering departments and utilities, um, stormwater departments working together and collaborating on these issues at the local level. Uh, like I said, it's going to take a targeted but holistic approach. What that means is that it needs to be holistic, but we really need to target these specific corridors and these specific neighborhoods um, with better transportation design, housing redevelopment, and commercial corridor planning. We tend to be very good at doing each one of those things in and of themselves, but rarely do we ever really tackle a neighborhood with all three at the same time. And in order to do that, we need to focus our resources, both to build momentum um, within the community and to act as a catalyst for new investment. Because frankly, we in the public sector can serve as catalysts, but we really don't have the money or the ability to bring about whole scale or wholesale uh, community redevelopment. It takes private investment and private development. Uh, we want to get that rolling and make the opportunities available for people to put money back into the community. And in order to do this, uh, we're going to utilize the 3P approach. And this is something that Mark Fenton, who he showed on the previous slide, uh, discusses a lot. Um, the 3P approach, other than the obvious planning, calls for utilizing policies, programs, and projects. And we see that in our waterway, uh, the way we handle our waterways now. As Brian discussed, we've got all these policies in place, all these regulations in place. We've got great design tools to use. Um, but we don't really tie all those together in planning for our communities as often as we should. So I'm going to look at each one of the specific uh, bullet points I talked about, the transportation design, housing redevelopment, and commercial corridor planning, and give a few examples from um, what we're doing in the city of Newark that hopefully will help. Um, like I said, I don't know that they're going to be brand new suggestions, but um, perhaps bringing them together in a new way uh, will be helpful for folks. Jennifer, I see the, uh, the menu popped up. Are we having technical problems, or should I just minimize that? 
you can just minimize the menu. So the first one we're going to talk about is designing a better transportation facility. And first and foremost, uh, I think it's becoming the norm, but uh, it's critical to implement complete streets legislation. I think we're going to do a, a poll now to check and see how many folks out there have some sort of complete streets legislation in place. And we also want to know whether, if you do have it in place, is it a policy? Is it a resolution or ordinance? Um, is it design standards? or uh, something else that uh, we didn't name. And if you do have one of those other policies, we'd welcome learning more about it. So if you can just type into the question box a little bit of information about what that other category is, we'd appreciate it. And then that way we can share that with others. We'll give everybody a, a few seconds to go ahead and get in their vote. And I see um, two people have gone ahead and typed into the other category. I'll read those off once we close the poll in just about two seconds. Okay, so 25% of you have a policy in place, 14% have a resolution or ordinance, 30% have design guidelines, 7% identified other, and 44% said they don't have anything in place. And of those that said other, one said, Felicia uh, said it's in their comprehensive plan, uh, Josh said it's in their state legislation from the State Department of Transportation, and uh, Kate says she works for a transit agency that is starting to see some sub area plans that include design standards and some are moving towards complete streets and uh, Lisa said that she thought that New York State passed an ordinance uh, this spring and another uh, Julie said she's working for a school system uh, that's probably working on some of these issues as well so Aaron I'll turn it back over to you that's great that's uh, I think if we had done this a year ago we wouldn't be well over 50% of, uh, of people tuning in that would say they've got some legislation in place. Uh, and obviously it's getting more and more wide ranging, um, going to different levels of government and also to uh, different entities like school systems. That's great. Um, what I'm going to talk about real briefly is two of the more common options, um, passing a complete streets policy um, versus a resolution and what those might look like. Uh, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning uh, Commission here, which is the MPO for the Central Ohio, the City of Columbus, and the surrounding area, has a very comprehensive Complete Streets policy. It's actually one of the leading policies in the country uh, right now. And it provides not only um, regulations that need to be followed uh, by anyone utilizing their funding, but also design guidelines. Um, that give you cross sections and various uh, scenarios and how to design for complete streets in those different scenarios. Uh, I'm actually going to let Brian just give a, a little bit of uh, input on that as he was one of the reviewing members of the uh, of uh, that committee. Yeah, that process through Morpsey took uh, quite a while and there's a number of input sessions both from uh, urban portions of the community as well as some of the rural portions. Uh, Morpsey covers, uh, I know we had some county engineers from some of the areas outside of the city of Columbus and they were very concerned. Um, there's a total of 12 counties in, in uh, Morpsey's uh, jurisdiction. <clears throat> the county engineers are very concerned that uh, something was going to be jammed down their throat that was going to be very city looking and um, were I think felt better about the process once they had a chance to be involved and see that a complete street doesn't necessarily mean any one thing, but uh, can be adapted to, uh, could be as simple as just providing an asphalt shoulder, for example, instead of a uh, gravel shoulder uh, is much more conducive to bicycle riding. Um, and as part of that, they also developed a toolkit to provide the local communities uh, resources to help them develop their own uh, city complete streets policies. Great. And then 
with the, at the city of Newark, we recently, earlier this year, I think it was February that it finally got passed, um, we passed a complete streets resolution. And it's a little bit different. We felt it was a little bit better option for the city. And essentially what it does is directs, it doesn't have specific policy uh, guidelines or design guidelines in it. What it does is direct city staff to incorporate complete streets in a few different ways. And we deal with public projects or investments in one way. We deal with um, private development in another. So what it does is it directs the city staff on any transportation project the city's doing, whether it's um, whether it's a maintenance, uh, new construction, reconstruction, um, any type of transportation project, the city's required to sit down and it's the uh, delegates who who is responsible for making this determination. But the city needs to sit down and determine how we can implement complete streets policy or uh, principles in that design. We need to determine what modes need to be accommodated. And if we decide that a certain mode cannot be accommodated, it sets out the stipulations for um, what you need to essentially prove and why that mode could not be accommodated, um, whether it's not cost effective, um, whether there would be significant environmental issues. It basically lays out the criteria um, that would be necessary to, uh, to show if we're not going to accommodate a certain mode on a transportation project. Uh, it also directs the city staff, uh, primarily the planning department, to revise all of the zoning regulations, the subdivision regulations, and the engineering design standards to accommodate complete streets principles. And in that way, we take into account all future private development that will be occurring in the city. So by making our zoning code um, meet complete streets principles, um, we're ensuring that our private development will meet that. And the third way we deal with that is we look for other projects to essentially team up with. So any kind of stormwater utility, uh, water line project, uh, sanitary sewer project, or any other options um, like that, we look for opportunities to implement complete streets principles when those projects are going on. So a lot of times you'll have to dig up a roadway to replace a water line. And when that is done, that basically triggers the complete streets uh, 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 principles, and then we need to sit down, the review committee needs to sit down and look at how can we make this roadway work better for all modes. So there are several different options as uh, we see in the, in the, the poll. There are several different ways to roll out complete streets legislation, but the key is to get something on the books and to start thinking a lot more holistically about how we design our, uh, our roadways. And um, Brian was just mentioning that all MORPC funded projects are subject to the MORPC Complete Streets policy. So that covers um, a, a wide range of municipalities, townships, uh, counties, and all of their projects. Um, moving on with our approach to the city of Newark is moving toward doing this targeted uh, approach to our corridors and some of our neighborhoods that need some help. So the Complete Streets legislation is a citywide effort. But then what we're starting to do is prioritize CIP projects in these specific areas. So we may have stuff that we're looking to do um, you know, one, two, three, four, five years out. As we look at these specific parts of town, we're going to start prioritizing, reprioritizing those projects higher um, because we want to target our efforts and our funding and our resources in these specific areas. Again, um, an option is to try to match mobility improvements with other projects, uh, like utility projects. And then just wanted to list a couple potential funding sources that may not be your transport or your traditional transportation projects. So you've got your safe routes to school um, funding, which is great because it's 100% uh, reimbursable funding, so it doesn't require a match. And it can be used for promoting any kind of, um, obviously, any kind of pedestrian or bicycle improvements, uh, safety improvements at intersections. The great thing I like to point out to school districts and communities um, when we're working on this is that just because we're doing a project for safe routes to school and it's primarily intended to help kids get to and from school, uh, the other 22 hours a day that kids aren't going to and from school, it's a benefit to all pedestrians and cyclists in the area. So it's a way to really get some significant improvements built in, uh, in these neighborhoods, many of which tend to still have neighborhood schools. So 
uh, when you're looking at Safe Routes to School, you're looking at a two-mile radius around the school. That'll often encompass the entire neighborhood. Transportation enhancement funds are great, uh, as long as both them and Safe Routes to School funding are, is available. Um, they're great to do sidewalk and other pedestrian um, and uh, bicycle improvements. Um, look at stormwater utility fees as ways to put in bump outs, uh, rain gardens, other things that can be that can help to improve the mobility and accessibility of the corridor um, while also working toward improving stormwater quality. So a little bit of creativity. Uh, there are several other funding sources that I'm sure folks are using as well. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is housing rehabilitation. So the most common use of, uh, or the most common funding source is going to be CDBG funding, community development black grants. Uh, it's not only the most common, but the most flexible. Uh, you can use it for a wide range of of things. In the city of Newark, uh, what we're primarily doing in terms of housing is uh, funding some of our other housing programs using it for um, match. Uh, we've got our community, or, um, I'm sorry, we have our uh, uh, emergency and minor home repair program. Uh, we provide down payment assistance to homeowners, um, fair housing and tenant uh, rights, counseling, along with several, several other uh, programs that are funded through CDBG to help encourage home ownership and to help rehabilitate homes uh, that people are in uh, so hopefully they can stay there uh, and stay in the neighborhood. Similar, we've got NSP and home programs. The house you're seeing on the right is a house that at the time this picture was taken we were just starting work on, but that sign in front uh, essentially says that this is a City of Newark NSP house and it's basically just a way to show the community, the city of Newark's out here working in this community. Um, we're putting NSP dollars toward uh, rehabilitating this house, and then it'll eventually go back on the market to, uh, to sell to someone, um, create a new homeowner in the neighborhood. Putting up those signs is a great way to make community awareness of what's going on. And as I said uh, a couple slides ago, we want to start to focus our efforts, and one of the primary reasons we want to do that is to build momentum. This is a way to build momentum and excitement in the neighborhood. If people see that investment from the city is going into this neighborhood, they're more likely to consider investing in a home, investing in a business in that community. Another great program that we work a lot on a lot of houses with is the Healthy Homes and Lead Abatement Program. Uh, this allows us to go in and do significant improvements to houses. Um, obviously, the housing stock in these older neighborhoods tends to be older, um, so anything before 1978 is eligible for this program, and uh, while it's primarily targeted at lead abatement, uh, we can do several, uh, several different things to homes, um, provide new windows, provide new doors, uh, repaint, provide siding, any number of things uh, that will help to increase the property value of the home as well as make it safer to live in. One of the key things we've been working on uh, since late last year is code enforcement, um, but getting proactive about code enforcement. In these neighborhoods that we're targeting, make sure you get out there, make people aware that um, code enforcement is an important tool for the community, for the city to use to help improve the neighborhood uh, for everyone that lives there. Once people are aware of it, then once you're out there, uh, they really start to appreciate it and you start to, uh, start to see some improvements. Um, people start to uh, you know, let their neighbors know that it's something that is happening and you know we need to get our our make sure our properties are up to code and uh, you know grass is cut even minor things like that peeling paints fixed um, even minor things like that start to kind of change that trend of the broken window syndrome and, and make it look like a community that's cared for uh, and people feel more comfortable there and another uh, key of code enforcement is the sidewalk maintenance um, maintaining accessibility particularly for disabled persons in the community and a fairly new one is uh, funding sources and neighborhood choice grants um, that I don't think the actual, I don't, I think the first implementation around is coming up soon, um, but a way to help provide public housing um, for folks in lower income neighborhoods as well. And the last uh, area that we're going to talk about in terms of implementation is commercial corridor redevelopment. So, so basically what we've done is to this point we have focused on making the channel itself, the roadway, safer and more accessible. We've worked to restore the habitat around the channel, 
Um, so we've done housing redevelopment to help get homeowners in, um, help the people that are renting in the neighborhood have better uh, places to live, um, safer, healthier, and more attractive places. And the last key to, the, to this uh, entire neighborhood focus is the commercial corridor redevelopment, restoring what used to be a key economic corridor um, for the community back to what it was. So the first thing we're working on is form-based zoning, uh, and this is just kind of a, a, an illustration of the generals of form-based code, uh, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. Um, but doing form-based zoning to, to elevate the level of design and the level of development that occurs and ensure that the development that occurs particularly on the arterial corridor is of a scale and a uh, relation to the public space that's appropriate for the surrounding neighborhood. So we want the arterial corridor to relate well to uh, other buildings along that corridor and to the, the neighborhood around it. A couple programs that we've recently put in place in the city of New York is a small business loan program and a facade improvement program, both funded out of our CDBG uh, program. And basically these are geared toward helping small business owners um, or potential small business owners do generally minor but still important improvements to their business. So if someone's looking to just get started and is maybe having a little bit of trouble getting a loan, uh, this may be what puts them over the edge and tips the scale so that they can start that business they were looking to. If they were maybe looking to expand a little bit, buy a new piece of machinery, um, bring on a couple of new staff members, this gives them just enough uh, leverage to be able to do that. And similarly with the facade improvement program, uh, you know, this helps folks fix up, maybe it's just to buy an awning, maybe it's just to repaint a sign. Um, it could be something more significant, but this helps folks to, to fix up their businesses along that corridor and uh, make it a more attractive, more comfortable place for people to spend time. Uh, brownfield assessment is, or brownfields tend to be a significant issue in older urban neighborhoods, a lot of which, um, as is the case in Newark, developed around industrial sites and factories. Um, what we're looking at doing is moving from specific brownfield sites and assessments to doing an area-wide assessment and remediation. So take a look at your entire community or the entire neighborhood, identify all the sites, and set up a plan for how you're going to get each one assessed and remediated. Uh, on a larger scale, uh, you may want to look at TIFs and CRAs. Um, we're working with this on potential larger developments, obviously, uh, and we're looking at these places where we're fairly confident that uh, that development's going to come along. Um, so it's it's generally not going to work for your smaller businesses, but um, if you're fairly confident that you might have a large um, developer come in, um, this may be a good tool to use as well. And there tend to be smaller grants out as well for community gardens and farmers markets, things that get the community engaged and again encourage that local business. And then finally, historic preservation and energy efficiency tax credits, um, both available at the federal level and at least here in Ohio, um, the, uh, the historic preservation tax credits are can be matched with uh, state tax credits as well. So there's a lot of different resources out there and available. Um, it takes a little creativity to kind of piece them together, but the key is getting different disciplines in the room, talking together, and putting together a focus plan for how to utilize all these different city resources, all these different state resources and federal resources to help this community uh, kind of restore to what it was at one time. And that's our, uh, that's our slides. Thank you for tuning in. I think we're going to open it up to any questions people might have now. Uh, we might finish up a little bit early. Okay, great. So Daniel has a, uh, the first question for us. Is this community erosion and decline in public meeting space that you describe mostly due to the increase in automobile use, or is it more attributable to other social changes going on? And before you answer that question, I'll just let everybody know they're welcome to type questions into the question box on your GoToWebinar menu. So, Brian, Aaron, a response to that question about the community erosion and decline in public meeting space. If you're asking whether we have statistics to verify which is a higher uh, reason, uh, no, the answer is no. But uh, it's a combination of both, I'm sure. Um, 
the corridor that we were working on at the time involved both. It was uh, an area of the city that experienced um, both uh, people leaving the downtown area at the time that, that the suburbs became easy to get to. It was kind of a catch-22. Yeah, I think it's hard to point to a specific, um, you know, point to increased traffic as the, the single cause of the downfall of this one community or any given community. Um, I don't think we'd ever say that that's the only factor that causes it. Um, but what we do see, you know, we, as we talked about this and as we, as we work through the community some of these issues um, on the plan we're working on, um, what we would see is corridors that are um, vibrant and in the center of communities that are vibrant and healthy have a lot of activity generally have slow moving traffic and cars are not the most important um, beings in that corridor. Uh, in, the, in the case we were talking, uh, that we were working with, this corridor is basically used by people that live north of the community we are working in as a quick and convenient alternative to the highway. And um, obviously in their interest they wanted to keep functioning that way. Um, so what we started to ask is, you know, what's, what's more important? Is it more important to help people get home? Um, obviously, this is going to continue to be a transportation corridor, but um, are, we, are we willing to do that at the detriment of the people that currently live in this community and have to cross a street? In this case, there's a park and a school um, on one side of the street and a lot of residential on the other. So are we willing to do that? Um, are we willing to sacrifice the safety of kids going to and from the park and the school to help people get home fast, a little bit faster from work? Great. So the next question is, um, was from Kirby and Allen, and they were asking about the bike lane example that you showed, and they were questioning whether um, putting in place the bike lane adjacent to the lanes of traffic between the parking and the traffic makes sense, or whether or not there are better ways to do this, and, and if this way makes sense, then what are the advantages? Are you referring to the complete streets example uh, that Aaron showed her in the slides? I, I believe so. You may want to go back to that slide. Sure, we can do that. Um, I don't remember which slide it was. We'll work toward that. Um, generally, when we're putting in bike facilities on a road, and remember we're talking about generally arterial streets um, that and we're showing this one as two lanes, and this is just kind of an example, um, but lanes with fairly high traffic volumes uh, and, and moderate speeds, most people aren't going to be comfortable driving, riding their bikes in the travel lanes. So installing bike facilities, whether it's bike lanes um, or a sharrow, or if you happen to have room, um, side paths, any of those facilities are going to increase mobility and access for people that may not drive. Um, in the case of bike lanes specifically, it's putting them between on-street parking and the, the travel lane is the safest place to put them. Um, there, are, there are some other options. There are cycle tracks that would go between the, the on-street parking and the curb. Um, some places are trying them. I think the, in general, among the cycling community, the jury is still out. Um, but in general, putting cyclists near the road um, where they're going to be most visible to motorists and uh, not hidden by cars or other obstructions is the safest place for them to be. Okay. So uh, Katie asked, how do you convince fire departments to support complete streets concepts? Talk to them early and often. Um, so far in our conversations with uh, street projects, um, We've uh, done a couple of corridors that have added bike lanes and 10-foot um, lanes were used and the particular fire department did not have a problem with that. Um, that's, I'm sure, going to vary by community and what the expectations of a particular area are. If you're in a, a denser urban area where 10-foot lanes are not that abnormal, then that's a little bit easier to do. Um, but I would say getting involved early and early and often. <laughs> yeah. 
So I'll just add to that and say that in uh, one of the communities I was working with, we actually worked quite closely with the purchasing department because the fire department would insist on certain wits and other things, but we actually got the purchasing specs for the largest truck that they have and were able to do demonstrations that showed if you had two Suburbans parked on the same, you know, on opposite sides of the street and you had the largest fire truck and you had the pads out and, you know, if you did everything exactly in the biggest way you could, that you could still fit the fire truck down the street and so we were able to provide evidence to the fire department that helped convince them that you know we do in fact understand what their needs are and we're you know we think fire safety is important but we can still achieve this complete streets objective at the same time and, okay and just to add uh, the the urban neighborhoods we're talking about tend to be on more gridded patterns so there is going to be more frequent access um, and what we did in, in this neighborhood we were talking about, we actually were looking at running transit down some of these residential streets. So we had already done turning templates um, for buses, all of which had worse turning radii than fire trucks. So um, when we had the transit authority kind of, you know, sign off and, and say, yeah, you know, any of our buses could fit down these streets you're proposing, um, it kind of, you know, not that we want to go against or, or argue with the fire department, but it kind of cut out that argument. Um, one other option might be to barter and say we'll get rid of cul-de-sacs in other places if you guys support this. The next question, any thoughts as to the extent that NIMBYs cause corridor decline or are the result of corridor decline? That's a question from Bruce. Yeah, we actually uh, we kind of coined a, a different term also with uh, this because the NIMBYs were, they weren't really, it wasn't really their backyard, it was their neighbor's yard, it was the people that lived south of them. So we kind of started calling them chimneys, it was can't happen in my neighbor's yard because they really, folks that were fighting this weren't in the neighborhood, it wasn't NIMBYism, um, it was folks that wanted to continue to be able to drive home at 40, 45, even 50 miles an hour uh, down a street where there's residences. Um, so they get home a few minutes earlier. So it was certainly a an, an issue we faced, and we ended up doing a significant amount more public involvement. Um, we had we had done a survey, and we actually had to reopen the survey and send it out to folks that weren't within our planning area. Uh, we held another public meeting uh, for folks specifically from those areas, and we met with um, their kind of neighborhood uh, commissions to to kind of discuss some of the issues. Uh, you're not going to convince everyone, um, but one of the things we pointed out is in Columbus particularly, we have very good and not very congested interstates uh, that are designed specifically to get folks into and out of downtown. Um, and then it becomes really just a policy decision by the city in this case about whether or not, uh, you know, what the importance of that roadway is going to be and what, what its function is going to be. And also to encourage uh, data collection. Um, we had numerous people talking about the speeds, and we actually had the speeds in our hands and could talk about what the real speeds were. And uh, even on the, the staff side, um, the engineering staff were convinced that the corridor was perfectly designed for the speed limit, which is 35 miles an hour, and we had data that verified that uh, significant percentage of people were traveling above 40 and some above 45. Okay, uh, and what is the acronym CHIMNEY again and what's it stand for? That, uh, I don't know if it's caught on yet, but that was uh, <laughs> can't happen in my neighbor's yard. Okay, can't happen in my neighbor's yard. Okay, so That's how do you... Pending. Yeah. <laughs> All right, how do you affect, uh, Joel has a question, how do you effective, uh, do effective transportation planning in conjunction with the form-based code? Form-based code focuses primarily on building relationships to other buildings and to streets rather than associated uses of the building. However, the primary tie between private property development and transportation facilities is land use. It would seem as though form-based code is not conducive to achieving the most appropriate relationship between transportation facilities and adja the adjacent development. So how would you deal with that challenge? Well, one of the most critical will shrink the uh, menu there. One of the most critical 
parts of a form-based code and, and something you can't create one without is public space standards in addition to the building form standards and the regulating plan. Um, and that should include cross-sections of what the street's intended to look like and how the buildings and um, public space relate to one another. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to require a, a building owner or a property owner to you know, build bike lanes or build bump outs uh, into the street. But what it does show is what the intended pedestrian space is going to be and how that space is going to relate to um, the private space. Uh, I think particularly in areas where you want to have a lot of commercial development, that, that sidewalk space tends to kind of blur the line between public and private, and that's where the most critical interactions occur. You know, when somebody's walking down the street, um, if you want them to go into an into and out of shops and restaurants and spend time on the street, uh, they need to feel like the, the shops along there are an extension of the public space, places they want to interact with people and spend time. So uh, I would say the, the public space is, if not as critical, very close to as critical as the uh, building form standards. And as far as the relationship, um, I guess my thought on that would be that um, for many, many years, we've been using uh, trip generation rates for particular land use without consideration as to distance, uh, its proximity to other land uses. So we take a household and we assume so many trips per day, and that goes into uh, the model that generates the number of vehicles on the road. But it is not cognizant of whether that residence is adjacent to the place where that person works, and that kind of gets back to where we were talking about mixing the uses to actually uh, manage the demand on the transportation system. If you don't have a policy in place that says we are going to reduce the trip generation from a particular site by doing X, Y, and Z, by mixing land uses, by providing the bike and ped facilities or the transit facilities, then you are correct in that you are left with the correlation between the land use and the number of trips, ge trips generated from the site. So I guess to get back to the form base, it's, it's not that there's a direct correlation with the form base, but it's the fact that you need this holistic view of creating a place that people want to be and don't need to drive from one place to another necessarily. Okay, so the next question is from Andrew. What specific improvements have been implemented that have helped shift local trips off statewide and regional facilities that move people freight goods over long distance, such as interstates, to other more localized roadways? Can you go? Can you read that one again? That was a that was a complicated one. Yeah. So the question was about um, the shift of traffic from highway corridors of, you know, kind of the heavy, the freight moving goods onto more local streets and uh, what trends you're seeing in that shift of, of transportation mode or, the, I guess, freight traffic. Well, I don't know that we saw a lot of, um, that was one good thing actually was that we didn't see a lot of freight traffic in this particular study. There was actually a perception um, in the neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods that there was a lot of freight traffic utilizing this corridor and that was one of the arguments from some folks about why uh, we couldn't look at things like reducing the number of lanes or the width of lanes or installing multimodal facilities. Uh, but again, when we looked at the data, we saw that really this wasn't a corridor that was used by, uh, by freight. Um, there's parallel, there's actually two parallel uh, highway facilities that um, would utilize any freight or that would any freight would utilize. Um, obviously that's not going to be the case for everywhere and it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I don't know that there's any overarching trends about freight using um, the surface streets versus, uh, versus the interstate streets uh, or the interstates or other highways. Um, in general, obviously, we want to encourage them to restrict their local trips to when they need to make a delivery in that area. And I would also go back to the policy level thought process. Um, Aaron mentioned that we got some, I don't want to say, I suppose backlash is the right term, but people challenging the reduction of capacity on this surface street corridor. 
and the question is, when you've got two parallel highway facilities, is the surface street at a policy level supposed to serve as a backup when the freeway has an accident and gets congested, or is it supposed to serve the community that makes up the city, the, the series of communities that create a city? And once you force people to, to acknowledge the fact that, well, you're right, um, I'm not trying to create a backup for the freeway system, uh, the, this neighborhood is more important, then the, uh, the comparison I like to make is, if you're familiar with the movie The Matrix, when uh, throughout most of the movie they're running from the, uh, the agents when Neo finally realizes that he doesn't need to run and the bullets stop, that's kind of when you get the acknowledgement at the high policy level that we don't need to continue to chase the traffic. We're about creating neighborhoods. Anyone still there? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, so Robert and a couple of other people have asked about how important policies and ordinances that encourage mixed-use development are to the complete streets concept. Um, I would say they, they, are, uh, they go hand in hand, um, just like form-based code needs, uh, needs to have the private and public space addressed. Um, things that encourage mixed use uh, and redevelopment of neighborhoods um, is critical going hand in hand with complete streets. As I said earlier, you know, we can make the greatest street the most accessible street ever, but if we're not encouraging um, people to move into, um, to start businesses and to um, patronize businesses in these communities, then um, you know, it really doesn't matter what kind of facility is there. Um, people aren't going to come and use it. Um, and that's one of the the key issues, one of the key difficulties with working in um, neighborhoods that have seen disinvestment for, frankly, going on 60 years now, um, and a neighborhood that has a strong commercial core and has strong um, um, residential development, some of those things are going to take care of themselves. Um, the, the informal and formal community mechanisms are there to help encourage some of that stuff to happen. It's in neighborhoods that have seen a lot of disinvestment and have started to have experienced this erosion that um, Really, there need to be some incentives and policies and projects and programs in place to encourage that investment um, along with the complete streets concept. Okay, and James has asked, have you seen policies defined on level of service for non-motorized modes developing from the new Highway Capacity Manual 2010 procedures? No. <laughs> The answer is no, I haven't seen anybody define how they're going to use that uh, level of service for non-motorized travel yet. Okay. And that's one of the reasons I want to make it a point of it to, to get that activity going. Okay. Um, Leaf is asking a question about, have you had any experience with the inclusion of uh, low-impact development stormwater techniques for any of the complete street projects that you've seen? Uh, yeah, City of Columbus is doing some great ones. Uh, actually, Brian and I were just down in the uh, city of Lexington, Kentucky, I want to say it was last fall, or maybe it was the spring. Um, they had some great projects. Uh, more and more cities, complete streets, I think, is starting to mean not just accommodate all modes, but um, do a complete job of, of making the street more accessible, more green, uh, more sustainable. Um, so it's looking at exactly those kind of things. Um, st better stormwater management, on-site stormwater management, um, using recycled materials, uh, a, a much broader range of, of how, you, how we design and, um, and build our streets. It's exciting to me because it's another funding source. Um, we, in, in my, our office here, have people specializing in uh, more the water quality side of things and to find out that they're putting in what I would call a bump out which is they're using it as a rain garden and to see that that one device is being used for uh, traffic calming as well as water quality is, is uh, neat. And I'll just, I'll just point out um, one other thing. We actually have a grant application in right now that um, we were able to work with our stormwater department 
to raise part of the match uh, for our grant application because we're going to be putting in um, rain gardens to help uh, in our it's in our downtown area where we have still have some combined sewers so it's helping to pull some of the flow out of the combined sewer overflow um, which meets our which meets our uh, federal mandate um, or helps them out and so they were willing to put up um, a fairly significant chunk of money to help us um, toward our local match uh, in applying for this grant. Okay, great. So Alan wants to know, how did the dynamics of this process change when the affected streets are owned and maintained by the State Department of Transportation? Well, um, as a matter of fact, this corridor is owned by the, it's, it's not, it's owned by the City of Columbus, but it is a U.S. route. And um, the biggest uh, feedback we got was to maintain a one minimum 12-foot lane uh, was the criteria that, uh, but the state was involved as a stakeholder early in the process because we were concerned about what the potential implications would be. Um, now one option would be for the local municipality to basically take over um, all maintenance responsibilities. They're, the city maintains it, but they receive federal funding for that maintenance. So they weren't real excited about giving up that federal funding for the maintenance, so they found it a better choice to at least maintain one 12-foot lane. Um, other than that, uh, the state has been uh, reasonably agreeable to the city's desires. Great. So the next question is from Stephanie. Have you considered programs, policies, or projects that invest in the wildlife or human capital of a neighborhood as part of the holistic approach to healthy community design? So she's thinking about employment programs, after school, and programs for children, um, churches, scout troops, community halls, etc. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I just listed a, a couple of our uh, CDBG programs and just for clarification, uh, the city of Newark's an entitlement community, which most larger urban areas are. Um, many smaller urban areas may not be and may be going through the state um, for specific projects. Uh, we're an entitlement community, so that gives us a lot of flexibility, obviously, in determining how that funding is used. Um, and I was drawing a blank because we actually do have so many different um, programs and projects that our CDBG funding goes for. Um, just off the top of my head, I would say probably a third of our funding goes toward uh, the exact kind of programs you just listed. Um, there's some that, a little bit that goes toward uh, youth services. It's basically we give um, money to an organization that, and it's a competitive process, but an organization that will provide some kind of um, activities or after school program or something else for youth. Um, we provide funding for Great. Okay, so the last question that we have, I think we have exactly the right number of questions for our time today. Uh, Norbert wants to know, what amount of municipal financial assistance is available through the Facade Improvement Program for a single project? And then we got one more question that snuck in at the end, so we'll, we'll get to that one as well. Homeless shelter. I'm sorry, you cut out for a minute. Okay, well, it seems like we lost our audio connection with Brian and Aaron, but that's okay. We're right we're at the end of the session right now. Thank you all for joining us very much. We really appreciate your participation. As you're leaving the session, you'll get an evaluation form. We'll ask that you complete that, and that will give valuable feedback to our speakers today. As a reminder, we have a bunch of upcoming webcasts that you can register for, and we have a new Twitter feed, so you can follow us at Planning Webcast, and we'd be happy to have you join us. You can contact Brian or Aaron at the email addresses that are shown on the screen there. And thank you very much for joining us today or during today's session.
Brian and Aaron, if you can still hear me, I will follow up with you by email and give you a copy of the evaluation report from today's event. Thank you very much for the presentation. You got some excellent questions, and I will uh, look forward to corresponding with you after the session. Thanks so much.